Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. <coughs> today, we, today we celebrate the uh, great Saint Nina, Enlightener of Georgia, who was a relative of Saint George, I, I read. Uh, and uh, like you find in all these, uh, many of these stories anyway, she had a, an extensive church family. So I received a blessing from the Mother of God in a vision to go to the land of Georgia and enlighten the people there. <coughs> and the story is full of many of the same things we've heard before, and there were, there were virgins that, were her, uh, that accompanied her, uh, many of whom were martyred. Uh, because they refused to marry some local lord or other, local pagan lord or other. But it, it turns to us to look at what she's known for and uh, what can we take from her example. The example of any anyone who's called equal to the apostles, uh, anyone who's called an enlightener of a place. As we uh, take our leave of the feast of Theophany, and we uh, have in our mind still the tremendous wonder of the vision of the Trinity, <clears throat> the manifestation of the Trinity. Think about uh, Saint Nina's, uh, her heavenly patron <clears throat> was the mother of God. We have to think about what the church really has to show us and what we have as individuals to, as individual members of the bodies of body of Christ as we go out from, from church into America. We have to think about what we are supposed to be doing and the example that we show and whether or not we can carry that vision of the Trinity, whether or not we can uh, remember that we ask for the intercession of the Holy Theotokos and Mother of God, the Mother of God, the bearer of the word. Uh, whether we can ask for her intercession and the intercessions of all the saints, including Saint Nina, to help us in our mission, which is to enlighten, to continue to enlighten the land of America. Not to retreat onto some kind of hillside waiting for the darkness to encroach upon us and to bring that light out from the hillside into the world as Father Chris as it was revealed and to Father Chris recently Deacon Chris that is not talking about myself in the third person yet Father Deacon Chris uh, revealed to me his uh, his own um, an amazement or revelation at, at, at sort of realizing what it means when it says in the scripture uh, and upon whom does the light shine but those that sit in darkness now if you're already in the light that means the light's already shining on you so that means that in order for the light to shine out again it needs to be on those who sit in darkness uh, it's not up to us to just leave them to their fate or to shrug our shoulders and cynically talk about how bad the Enlightenment was. Uh, the people that we're talking about are our own people, the people of our nation, the people who are currently... Uh, uh, we're, we're, our competition is the vision of the New York State Assembly rousing itself in applause as they approve the uh, abortion of 
of infants up until through the nine month, ninth month and after, because it's no longer required by law to save an infant's life if, she, if he or she survives the abortion. Uh, this is our competition. That's darkness. And the people who sit underneath it, who, who, are, who, are, who are living in a fog, who don't have the light of orthodoxy, the light of Christ shining upon them, who don't know any better, who just go along to get along, who, who don't want to be uh, looked at weird or talked about weird by their neighbors, and they don't know what their options are. That's darkness. We can't leave those people to their darkness. That's not something that it is correct to surrender to. It's very incorrect to sit back and watch those kinds of things happen around us and just think, oh, that's just the way of the world. I mean, don't, I just want to be normal. Normal? The norm of the earth is fallenness. That's, the, that's normal, to be fallen in sin, to live in darkness and to not know your left hand from your right hand and to be the slave of every strong man that comes along. That's the norm. What we have an opportunity to do here in this country that no one on earth history has ever had before is to be able to be a minority religion and worship in peace and spread our religion without fear of recrimination or persecution yet. There are legal recourses if somebody should try to stop us from doing so, in fact. And while that's the case, long may it continue, God willing, we have an even greater responsibility than those who have before us, like St. Nina, well, she had, we don't have a greater responsibility, we have a greater responsibility in our freedom than the average normal person has had in the past. Because it falls to us as the citizens of this country who live in a so-called Republican democracy, whose, uh, whose job it is to decide who it is that rules over us, ultimately. And not to, again, shrug our shoulders cynically and say the whole thing's manipulated and uh, what can we really do about it anyway? Or we can pray to God Almighty to enlighten our land and to give us the strength and to give our leaders the moral courage to do what's right we can do so in a way that is not defeatist. We can do so in a way that is uh, full of confidence in the strength of the Lord uh, shining forth in his might. Irresistible. Unconquerable. Uh, that's, uh, that's the Orthodox faith, by the way that we believe those things, that we, we don't believe that we're just, uh, just another religion amongst many. No, we believe that we have, not through our own effort, not through anything that we have merited, we have inherited, been given by our, our God, we've been revealed, it has been revealed to us, the one true faith. And as uh, the other Christian traditions shamefully fall into cowardice and darkness and the ways of the world, the fallenness of the world. It's not, <laughs> we, we, that, that should make, give us grim resolve, but not make us fall into darkness There's ourselves and just wonder when it's going to happen to us. It will not happen to us if we don't let it happen to us. If I don't say, well, I guess I'll just go along too then it won't happen. As long as there are two or three gathered in his name, he is there. And if Christ is there, what possible resistance could there be? Uh, these are the um, truths that animated the great enlighteners of the world. Our patron saints, all the holy apostles, St. Nina of Georgia. <clears throat> this was the uh, way prepared by St. John the Baptist, that's the way of the Lord. Uh, he says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord, and I can pick it up again. <clears throat> that's true on many levels. And uh, some of us may feel dead sometimes. We may, we may feel 
lax or uh, dark or <coughs> depressed or something like that. But we uh, have been told by our God, the God who has uh, protected us with his sacraments, that we can pick it up again and go forward and be animated. That means full of life, you know. To understand, uh, to, to choose, well, what spirit are we going to be animated by? Of course, the grace of God is the only thing that can save us. However, he also says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He doesn't say, behold, I batter the door down and force you, take you by the throat. No, I stand at the door and knock, and then uh, we still have to open the door. So a little bit of our will is involved. We can choose to listen to that knock and open the door and let him come in, clean out all the cobwebs, and get back up on our feet and follow him in the resurrection. It's true we have no continuing city, but does that mean we have to just let everything else hang? I, I, I only speak this way because of the disturbing number of people I've run into amongst Orthodox circles who seem to be animated by this particular spirit. Uh, our faith is meaningless if, if that's the attitude that we have. If we think that nothing can be done, if we think that the only thing that, that ought to happen is that somehow an Orthodox the theocratic empire ought to be reestablished, well, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in our lifetimes anyway, and if it does, it'll only be through massive violence and death. Not something we should wish upon the world. Uh, some of you may disagree. I wouldn't actually want to be a part of such an empire, because it, it, and for lots of reasons, we can discuss that later. That's my opinion. Nonetheless, this is where we are now. We are who we are. We're the product of our ancestry. We're the product of of the spirit of our nation, such as it is, it, that's, that's who we are. Whatever light we have is uh, at least partially informed by that. Whatever spirit we have, is, is uh, th that's our nation. It's not no nation. It is a nation that we're part of. And we need to recognize that. We may think that's a shame, or we may think that that's great. But it is the truth either way. And God has put us here. And so it's up to us to do the best that we can for our neighbors, for our fellow citizens, for our family, to teach our family to be the kind of warriors that want to go out and not be afraid to be orthodox and not, not turn away shamefaced uh, from what the world has to say because what the Orthodox Church has to say is in variance with it. Or to think that we're somehow wrong, or to be afraid of what our children will say to us if we tell them the truth. What kind of a world is it where your children get to tell you what to do? We can look outside, look on the front pages, look, in, uh, look at the New York State Assembly and understand the answer to that question. These are people who are cowards leading from behind not leading at all. Uh, our job is not to be cowards. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to be the one. Not everybody's called to do the same exact kind of activities. But we know, our, we know what, what our interests are, what our strengths are. If we don't know, if we've been just led about by the nose by the world, well, it's time to awake thou that sleepest and see what's going on, and then ask God to show us our strengths. He knows what they are, and he, he wants to work with us to develop them. But regardless of what we do, we shouldn't do so um, in fear. We should understand that, that the greatest of the saints, the, the people, all the people who, whose faces adorn these walls from whatever time they came from, they all had their own issues to deal with, my own son's namesake, uh, not, not, perhaps not the greatest example when it comes to whether or not you're supposed to kill large numbers of people uh, for your own political ends, but nonetheless, uh, he also, was, that's not why he's a saint. He's a saint because he built churches and he spread the faith, and he didn't do so by force. 
He built churches. He wrote hymns. He spread the faith. He was an enlightener. Uh, these are the things we need to keep in mind. We need to understand what the why the saints are saints. What is it that made them saints? Uh, and we need to try and find that part of within us uh, that is the saint. Uh, imagine what your face will look like. And paint it on an icon. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that anyone paint that icon, but your life, living your life, is painting that icon. God who made you already painted that icon. It'll be up to uh, someone later on, God willing, to express that, some prayerful iconographer perhaps. But in the meantime, we have the ability to paint with uh, the only thing that matters. It's like life itself, your very blood. Uh, the, you know, the time that you have left on earth um, is, is, is your canvas. So uh, let's not despair. Don't sink into darkness. Don't give in to the fog that's trying to be cast on you by the world. It's hard from Sunday to Sunday uh, to remember these things. It's really, uh, that's, that's really where your will can come into play. The grace of God is absolutely what saves us, and that's why, there, that's why by the way, in the, in the church, in his true church, guided by the Holy Spirit, we have repetitive services. We go through the cycle of the saints. We, we, we celebrate the same 12 great feasts. We have to be reminded of these things constantly because our will is so weak. And that from, from in, in the average uh, parish life, from Sunday to Sunday, we kind of just go out and just go ahead and do our thing, come back, and, oh yeah, that's right, uh, God exists. But let's do a little bit better, just a little bit better every week to carry it into Monday and maybe even to like the beginning of Tuesday and then see where we're at after a few weeks of trying that out. And it doesn't mean making an obnoxious uh, spectacle out of yourself. Uh, there are ways to go about doing things. Some of us, it may be our calling to make an obnoxious spectacle out of ourselves. That's okay too, if that's your calling, in prayer and humility with the guidance of your confessor, your spiritual father. But for most people, they'd like to just, again, interact with their neighbors, their workmates in a normal way, uh, being polite to each other, going about your business. But at the same time, what if instead of, of, of being another drone that goes around looking at the floor with no expression on your face, you become somebody who looks up and looks people in the eye and smiles at them and says, good morning. How's it going? Did you catch that game last night? Whatever, whatever the case might be. Be a point of light in that person's life. Uh, that's just something you can do maybe once per day more than you're doing now. And maybe throughout the course of a year, one of the people you interact with at, notices something and says uh, something about it. Um, why are you so uh, cheerful all the time or something like that? Who knows? And then you can tell them. Well, I'm not really, but I'm really trying. Because of this and that and the other thing, because of you know the risen Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who I'd like to tell you about. Or however the conversation might go. Um, these are the things that are things that we can do now. We don't have to wait for, for God to present us a circumstance where, oh, now's my chance to be a saint. That's when martyrdom happens. And that might happen too, but, but uh, there's also situations where you can go about and start making an effort and start participating, being, really being a fellow worker with God in the vineyard and really treating your fellow man as what they are, which is the holiest thing on earth. Holier than any relic we have, 
holier than any miraculous icon is every single human being. Whether they're a member of the faith or not, as tarnished as the image of God in them might be. Because we're made in his image. And we're alive, animated with the very spirit that he you know, created us all in the beginning. Breathed life into Adam. That comes from him. And that's his iconography. But uh, unlike these inanimate objects, um, we have freedom. We have freedom. And in that freedom, we can, uh, if you were to imagine these icons had some sort of power over themselves, and just constantly were just sort of, you know, on a nice sunny day, just decided to toss themselves into the mud. Uh, that's, that's what we do all the time. And that's, that's what we should really try to stop doing as much as possible. But nonetheless, it's the case that every human being you encounter or even know about, regardless of what lies are being told about them or what embellishments or exaggerations are being told about them in order to make you hate them, someone you don't know, every human being is holier than every single holy relic that exists. You need to remember that. We all need to remember that. I need to talk, I'm talking to myself as well. If we, if we really remember that and at the same time hold on to the spirit of courage uh, that we can receive from the Lord uh, to tell the truth, uh, then we won't find it as difficult to figure out where that middle path is between being humble and being truthful, saying what we need to say and worrying about what other people think of us. It won't become as difficult. Uh, so these are just a few thoughts on the day of St. Nina, and to remember, it's also something to remember, by the way, uh, uh, that she was uh, the Enlightener, she's known as the Enlightener of Georgia, and she's a woman, something not to, not to take lightly either. Uh, although, we're, we're very used to having women saints in the Orthodox Church, it's nothing out of the ordinary, but she's equal to the Apostles. <coughs> She enlightened a whole nation of people uh, over the efforts of the kings and rulers, princes of that land, and everything else like that, and including the emperor Diocletian, uh, she was able to conquer. Uh, all of us can take heart, take courage, and find our own strength and what qualities God made in us when he created this particular icon. So let's take heart and take courage, not look towards the darkness, but instead shine, unless we're going to shine a light right into it, not look, not, not be drawn towards the darkness, but only towards the light of Christ, and it says, in his light we see light. So, when it, think about that, when, when you think about what it means to bring light to a place, to be an enlightener. Thank him for the gift of our patron saints, the Holy Apostles, for the gift of St. Nina, Enlightener of Georgia, for the gift of the manifestation of the Trinity, and the theophany of his Son, Jesus Christ, for the gift of the nation all of us are blessed by God to be a part of, and uh, not follow the world at all, but follow only the Lord Jesus Christ in joy and light. Amen. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through the grace of love and the Lord.